Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Our guest today is D. Lynn Kelly. She is an author uh, writing with John Shook, who you probably know. He's been a guest on this podcast many times. Um, the new book is called Change Questions, a playbook for effective and lasting organizational change. So before I tell you a little bit more about Lynn, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thanks, Mark. It's so nice to be here. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. Congratulations on the launch of the book. And that's that's going to be kind of the launching point for a lot of our conversation here today. But let me tell you more about Lynn. She currently serves as an advisor to BBH Capital Partners. Um, and that's been following a career highlighted by different leadership roles in engineering, supply chain, and continuous improvement in various industries. Um, Lynn retired from Union Pacific Railroad in 2018. So there at Union Pacific, she was Senior Vice President of Supply Chain and Continuous Improvement. She was also the executive co-owner of the company's innovation program. Prior to that, she was VP of Operational Excellence, an officer and a member of the executive leadership team at Textron. So Lynn has a, a PhD in evaluation and research. She taught undergraduate and graduate statistics courses. And before that, she held positions of uh, executive vice president and chief operating officer of Doctors Hospital in Detroit. And nearby Detroit, I, I have to mention that Lynn grew up in the same town I grew up in. <laughs> Livon Can't believe that. Livonia, yeah. Michigan. Not where I was born. I was born um, in Ohio, which I don't brag about to the folks in Michigan, were you? <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Indiana. I'm a Hoosier. Yeah. So, but uh, my parents moved there when I was one. So, really, uh, a Michigander. Uh, uh, Michigander, and I I do prefer saying Michigander over Michiganian. I, I know there is sometimes uh, controversy over that, but <laughs> exactly. Well, we won't engage in the controversy on your podcast. <laughs> But good to speak to another. Uh, gosh, I don't even know Livoniaite. La yeah, let's Livonian. do that. Well, let's let's create it. Oh, Livonian or Livoniaite? Ite sounds like a a disease almost. <laughs> a Livonian. Okay. I think that that sounds very stakes worthy, Art. right? It it sounds like it could even be you know an important country. <laughs> okay, we'll stop. <laughs> right. Well, it's a, it's an important topic and an important book. Um, and you know, before we 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 talk more specifically about the book, you know, Lynn, with all the different things you've done, uh, different industries and different phases of your career, I always like to ask people though. You know, it's good to hear your story, your lean origin story, or or how would you? What I don't know what words you would even frame as as you frame it as as you tell that story. Well, you know, I just listened to one of your podcast guests where she talked about her early lean involvement was Dr. Deming. And mm -hmm. I got to say, I was also, can I say it now, a Demonite? <laughs> a Deming. Some people say Deming disciple. I don't, I okay. mean, sure, Demingite. <laughs> groupie, groupie. I like I, I, I mean, Groupie. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't go there. <laughs> But, anyway, okay. so Dr. Okay. Deming, how did you get exposed to yeah, him? Yeah, uh, so I I was in undergrad, and uh, and I was exposed to it. At that point, I was at the hospital, and and then um, I tried to apply some of those principles at the hospital. I was um, a little a few years later because then when I was in my master's program. We actually had a semester. It was a lockstep program, and we were in. It was automotive primarily because it's all Detroit. Yeah. I was one of the few kind of non-automotive folks, but we spent three weeks in at Toyota in Japan and studying way wow. back in the eighties, right? Wow. Studying um, what they were doing, and I remember watching. And we were on one of the walks, and we were watching a production uh, experience. And one of the GM guys said to the Ford guy, we'll never compete with this. And I thought, wow, wow. what, what is this? So yeah. I took it back at that point with the undergrad and the grad, and then Dr. Deming's influence, I took it to healthcare. And I, and it was written up as one of the first examples of lean, what was not called lean back then, but lean now in healthcare. And so yeah, then wow. uh, that, that kind of got me, that kind of got me hooked. And then weirdly, I got, I got the degree in evaluation and research, which is a lot of stats. And I did my dissertation, a statistical dissertation, which takes me five minutes to say, so I won't tell you the title <laughs> of my dissertation, yeah. but because Deming was, I mean, we're talking 
Deming was a statistician, so I got the degree. And then he worked at the Census Bureau, and I did a postdoc at the Census Bureau. And hmm. then I just decided, okay, enough of this kind of worshiping Deming thing. And and um, anyway, but but honestly, I still I still I go back to his, you know, drive out fear and oh, all of those things. So um, he had a great influence, I think, on a lot of people and a lot of hmm. industries. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and I think the need, I mean, that the 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 same calls to action or the same 14 points are are very exactly. much needed. Um I think, you know, uh, especially or at least for for one in healthcare um today. I mean, Dr. Deming, you know, deeply influenced a lot of people that we would consider um, you know, the the founders of modern healthcare quality and patient safety movements, Don Berwick and and others who like, were directly mentored or taught I, by Dr. Deming. Lucian Leap comes to mind as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. And then even remember um, when Joint Commission put in a control chart uh, sta- um, yeah. a criteria in their, in their standards. And at that point, um, I was teaching stats and they didn't know anybody in healthcare who knew about control charts. So they hired me to go around the country throughout a whole summer. I went from state to state and they'd bring these groups together and I would explain to people in the room, what is a control chart <laughs> and how does it apply to healthcare? So it was, um, yeah, was a lot of stuff happening back then. So how, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, as you recall, how did that opportunity to go spend the three weeks with Toyota even come to be? Well, this is a, a lockstep program that was done through Michigan State. And every class, every year, it's a two-year program, they held 30 spots, 10 for GM, 10 for Ford, 10 for mm. Chrysler. And then they had the rest of their st- spots for other people. And then they really focused on you. Everybody would have to take three weeks vacation in the summer. And they told you up front. And they went to a different country and studied different things every year. And ours was Japan. And then we spent a little time in Korea uh, and looked at the automotive industry there. And then, you know, for the few people that weren't in automotive, uh, I think they farmed me off to a hospital for (laughs) at some period of time. Um, So yeah, it was a, what a remarkable experience. Mm -hmm. And we were even when we went to Toyota and I don't even know the name of the professor, but one, we were taught with, with a translator, for a morning by one of the professors who everybody who was doing things at Toyota went through his courses. And and I bet it was somebody famous. I mean, if I bet it's somebody we, I would recognize their name now, but back then I had, you know, no frame of reference. So it was just unbelievable. Was, I I mean, I'm trying to think of the, I have no idea if the timing would even line up, but like, was it Professor Professor Ishikawa? <laughs> I know that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. You know, I mean, I think it was somebody big because they told us this is the guy. This yeah. is the guy. Um, but I didn't know till years later. Like, oh, I bet, I bet it was somebody. <laughs> Like, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, important. That's so cool that to have sat in that classroom, it was great. I do remember a little story he told us that. I mean, it was so funny because afterwards that seemed to be the thing that all the automotive folks glommed onto. But one of the things he said was, you got to be careful who you sell your cars to because the only people that want to buy American cars are the mafia <laughs> in Japan. <laughs> and then he said, so, so you know, we, you know, you got to be careful who you're selling to. I thought that was an interesting point. <laughs> that really hit you know, the automotive guys are going, what? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, now, and there, but, there, there's an old um, essay Dr. Deming had written, I think it's called like um, uh, notes on a hospital stay where he was the patient. And it's about a four page article pointing Ah. out some of the different systems issues that he was observing and um, coming across. And and I can link to that in the show notes. But my recollection of it, and it seems like it would be on brand for Dr. Deming, was that he was being, uh, if you will, hard on the system, but understanding yeah. of like people were doing, uh, you know, their best the efforts. Best. Right, right. But and I'm were... sure you way back, I sure you saw the studies that said people have no ability because they're not medical professionals to evaluate the actual care they're giving. So it's all that it's how often they their waste baskets is are emptied and cleanliness of the room. And a lot of times that's what healthcare at this, you know, the surrogate for mm-hmm. good hospital care is the friendliness of the employees. Yeah. 
things that are not directly related to medical care. Yeah. Um, but that's interesting. I, I didn't even know that about Deming. I want to, I want to try to find that. Well, you're going to link. Oh, to I, I, I right? will share it with you and, um, right. and, and the audience, but um, no, that, I think what you're referring to in, on that customer service evaluation, I've heard that that applies to plumbers or any, oh, any technical sure. trade, no offense to any physicians working to compare you to plumbers, but if we don't understand <laughs> how to evaluate, like when someone's done installing exactly. the dishwasher, Your furnace. I can only assume they've done a good job. I can evaluate right. the, the customer experience. And then it's only if it starts leaking two days afterwards, like, okay, I guess that wasn't done uh, correctly. You're right. You're right. Exactly. It's fine. Um, but then tell me a little bit more um about you know bringing those ideas into healthcare, and you know we're, we're, you might have been one of the first. Somebody said you know uh, a statement. Well, I think a lot of us doing work in healthcare today here. Patients are not cars, right? Yeah, right. I mean, it's yeah. true, but what do we do with? I mean, it's sort of meant to say like, <laughs> hey, go away. Don't bring these ideas from the auto industry. No, I'm curious I what know. kind of reactions or successes you had. Yeah. Well, and also um, in education, you know, I mean, I'm just going to springboard over there for a second mm -hmm. because you, you reminded me that patient is not cars. You know, when, when we all were identifying when I was a professor and everybody now was, of course, and when you're in Michigan, you can't help but be brought into some of these things. I no longer live in Michigan, but back then, you know, a lot of your students from, from the automotive industry and they, you know, they were introducing ideas. If you weren't talking about lean and TQM and all of that control charts, they're yeah. going to, they're going to say, well, what are you behind? Mm. Um, and, and when mm. we talked about customer service and then you, then you, in, in education, we were, I remember discussions were, well, who are our customers? It's kind mm. of the same thing issue, issue with, with healthcare because, yeah. Well, it's it's the students, but is it the students? Because do they get whatever they want? It's our whole goal <laughs> to make them, you know, do well, some of them want easy A's, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody, it's very interesting. It's not as straightforward when you're in some of these service industries. Sure. Healthcare has the same issue. Who who is the customer? Is it the patient? It, who is it? Who the insurance company that pays the bill? Is it the doc? Who is the customer? And it's right. it's nuanced. But you know what? I, I think. Very few things are straightforward, and the skill sure. is to understand the nuance and to do, not to look for black and white, but look for all those grays and try to build something around the grays because it's just an easy out to go black and white and just have these little rules that we rigidly follow. It's really important to stay in the space where we really understand every every. I just went off on a tangent. Sorry, sorry, but no, no, no. that's cool. <laughs> we have the, we have we the time. <laughs> we the beauty of a long podcast is we have time to do that. It's okay. Okay, cool, good, good. But but bringing it back, maybe I interrupted you then, and bringing it back to some of the early efforts in in hospitals and how people reacted to ideas from other settings like manufacturing. Well, I mean, you hit you hit a nail on the head. I mean, back then there were no examples, so there was a, a, the constant. You know, you have a hard enough. You know, if you work in manufacturing, you have two plants that make a very similar product and you try to take a best practice from one plant to the other f factory or plant and they're going to say well you don't understand that's not how we do yeah. it and we we're not like them so so much so that i found working in healthcare was it's not just you were not a car kind of issue but it was the whole thing of look we're we're not that doesn't relate to us at all and and i think the other thing is they view and in many ways it's correct, but so much of what they do is an art mm -hmm. and, and that, and that every day is different and every surgery is different. And now we have a lot more data that says the more standardization we could do the better. But, but I think there were a lot of people even more so back then that prided themselves, especially in medicine on the art of medicine. Mm -hmm. And, and really, so anything that comes through as standardization or standard work or, um, you know, any type of steps, you know, was difficult. I, you know, you had an easier time with 5S, you know, they could understand if everything's in the same place, fine. Right. But I, I think some of those other concepts were, were much more difficult back then. And now we have examples, we have successes and some really good successes. So I think it makes it mm. easier. Easier. Yeah. And I think it's like, yeah, but still to, not right. To what degree? And maybe this is a good segue 
to talk about questions around um, change and engaging people or the acceptance um, of change. Uh, the title of the book, again, um, Change Questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, even in healthcare, to maybe just detour on this a little bit. Um, for, for, for the talk, people will use this phrase, evidence-based. Evidence-based yeah. medicine, evidence-based practice. There is growing evidence out there of, let's say, for example, doing things a certain way, you know, with the uh, the management of central lines can basically um, lead to zero central line infections for very long periods of time, if not forever. But not every hospital does those things that way That's right. today. That's right. So yeah. there are, yeah. let, me, let me try to frame it as a question. I mean, people are complicated and um you know i think that's that's true and we have to navigate that what what are some of the other barriers to be you know so okay well we have evidence people should accept it now but i know don't I, why why is that well that was my uh, one of my ahas and i i've listened to some of your your mistakes podcasts and yeah. what in one of my biggest mistakes that's where i came across you know this whole idea, I, I rediscovered Michael Hammer's 2060-20 change curve. And and let me back up on that a little bit because before even Michael Hammer, I mean, way back, and I forgot the year I've got it, I've got it somewhere in my research, but somebody discovered this. And then, then they started, there was like ro- lots of replications of this 20% of the people are open to something, 60% in the middle are kind of neutral. And then the 20% at the end are not open to whatever it is. And then people started applying this researchers to a lot of different things, like, like your acceptance of a speaker who's speaking to you. If you're, if you go to a class or if you, any, lots of an HR, even just each like performance management. And it started being applied to a lot of different things. And then some researchers a little bit, few years later said, well, let's see really, which ones does it really fit with? And it turns out that the 2060-20 curve fits so well with change. It mm-hmm. really, really does. And 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 what I have found again and again is that even if people will benefit from the change, there will still be mm-hmm. approximately 20% who's gonna, they're gonna sit, they're not, they're not gonna be open to it initially, their gut reaction, first reaction. There's going to be the majority of people, 60% are going to be neutral until mm-hmm. they see successes. So that's how I explain that phenomenon is that, you know, some people just, you know, by the nature of the personality or whatever, tend to be a, a little bit resistant to change. And I have to jump in though, too, because I, I tend to take a shortcut cut and call them resistors. And yet, in the research has been a lot of stuff out there that says too don't label those folks yeah. because they are just sometimes loving what they do and the way they do it. And they think it's really good and they don't want you to mess with it or they really super care about something and they don't want you to mess with that. So there's, there's a, um, for change people who are, you know, really do change. There's a, a cautionary note. Let's not, jump to a shortcut mm-hmm. of calling them resistors. But my right. focus though is the fact that in general, you you should expect resistance for, for other reasons too. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Nobody. Right. <laughs> I don't right. want to be told what to do, right? Yeah. So there's there's a few reasons I think out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um I I've I've come to really dislike that labeling and and what what, what I often hear is blaming of a leader saying, oh well those right. people are resistant to change and like, well, they might be resisting this change. Right. And I, and I think the problem is when then, then a leader kind of labels or gives up on them or so, but right. we're going to force them to change where, where it's in like, well, as you put it um, a couple of minutes ago, if they're not open to, to the change initially, like to me, that that's, uh, that's, I'm sorry, that's, that should be the beginning of the conversation, not the end. That's right. And and what I what I talk about in the book is what I've learned for myself that really works is it's all about timing. So mm-hmm. if they're resisting this change, fine, let them do what they want. Let's run some pilots and run some experience. Let, let's get the bugs out because the middle 60% is neutral. Who has the loudest voice to pull them over if if you if you mess up, right? If you if so, if you roll out a change and it doesn't work, and then your work instructions are wrong, or all kinds of stuff. So why not 
you know, just iterate the heck out of it with change agents. And part of one of the change questions has to do with how do we recognize those early successes to start building hype? Is it is it little internal podcast? Is it the CEO comes and watches or talks about it? Or what is it? So the neutrals go, wow, that's so cool. And then then when we got when we have momentum, like Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point, we get that momentum, then we can also then tread carefully and work with people that are on the other that final 20%, but really get their feedback on how they can own it. Because we all know once we flip one of those folks, yeah. they're our best advocates, right? Yeah. 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 They, they certainly can be. And those become powerful yeah. stories. Um, right. I think of, I mean, this is an old commercial and an old reference, but the old life cereal commercial where the kids uh-huh. are surprised. Mikey oh, likes it. Mikey. Yeah. I forgot all about Mikey. <laughs> yeah. It's probably on YouTube right. for people who don't remember that commercial, <laughs> but, but everyone's got, you know, like, you know, somebody in, that, in, in the workplace and I'm seeing this through um, lean improvement. Uh, here's the word uh, program, you know, with, with quotes at some point it's it, it, starting off. It's always a program. It's a thing you're doing, but yeah. you know, some of those people that are known, to their colleagues as being skeptical of yeah. things. And, right. and, and, and I was uh, maybe connected to something I was going to ask you on the, on the cover of your book. It says in all capitals, no more flavor of the month. Like some of the you know, times people are just yeah. worn out on, we've been sold all of these exciting sounding things and then it never turns into anything or it doesn't sustain. So I'm done investing. Exactly. And do you blame things. them? No, do you not blame at all. them? They're smart. They're rational. Not, they have limited yeah. energy, and yeah. and that's why I really that's why I'm really passionate about. You know, we can have the very best solution, but if we don't introduce it in a way that engages people, that doesn't have a bunch of errors, and we've really thought through what are their frequently asked questions, how do I yeah. reward successes? Then, you know, a lot of the research says the probability of success is only 30 to 40 percent. There's other studies that say maybe a little bit more, but I can't find any study that says anything above 50 percent success rate for an organizational change. And it, even if it's 80 percent, we, we got to understand we leave damage behind when we fail to sustain a change. Yeah. It, you could you and everyone damages more until yeah. people are just jaded and their rational approach is to say, well, prove it. I'm not changing. Yeah. This is your 50th time you've asked me. To, I believed you the first 10. Right. You know, you've lost. And so we we really we have to respect people to such a degree that we don't think we can keep failing. Now we can keep iterating. And we can talk about them being a part of the process and the improvement, and we can iterate ourselves, but we cannot just walk away from all of these things and expect there's no fallout. Sure. And um, yeah, when, when, when somebody who is viewed as a skeptic or not going along with things, then does get excited about something that really brings those people in the middle along, I think much more quickly. It's the best. I mean, you just love it when that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and, and and I think when you take the time to to you know, well, pun intended, lean in and try to understand people's right. perspectives and work with them, because a lot of times they have they have legitimate concerns. They're like, well, yeah. I don't think this is going to work because of such and such. Take exactly. that input, iterate, make it better, and now you've right. you've, made, you've made more of an ally than um, an opponent. That's right. Do things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's fascinating though. You know, I was going to ask you, maybe there's a little more to say about the flavor of the month problem. I mean, it's so yeah. widespread, like everyone knows the phrase, they know that exists probably in their organization. Right. So gosh, it makes me wonder why, why is that problem still there? Or I, I guess your book will help people break that cycle if they, if they want to. Yeah, you know, and I, the more I dug into this, because I had always been in the in the Six Sigma lean space um, early on TQM. But then when I realized when I saw that things didn't sustain the way I wanted them to, or, you know, you do, you you get engaged people, you do a whole thing in a, in a plant and they move equipment and productivity increases. And it seems like engagement increases, but then you go back 
and it's gone. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, wait a minute, but it felt like it was, everybody was there. Like what's going on? Well, then I realized there's a, there's a lot more of human psychology that I needed to understand. And I just dug deep in the research and with a PhD in evaluation and research, you know, you know, now, you know, it's my natural inclination. And I just dug deep, deep, deep in the research and the human psychology of mm. change. Mm. And every time I failed, I would say, okay, this failure, I'm not going to blame them or it or whatever. I'm going to own this. What should I have done differently? And I research the nuances of that particular failure and then would come up with another change question. So, you know, basically, you know, there are these 11 questions that, um, that you really consider. And, and some of them, like I often can, could attach what the research says about a probability. Like for instance, if, if a company doesn't, if the work, if the infrastructure, like um, the way that people are rewarded or things like that work against the change initiative, no matter how good that change initiative has, if their performance evaluation is, is, based on something that's counter the change initiative, let's say the change initiative takes more time, but it increases customer satisfaction, but they're rewarded on how much time it takes or, or productivity. Right. The thing is that 16% of the time, people want to do the change and can't because the infrastructure works against them. So, you know, I got to the point with these 11 questions. Some of them are the slam dunks. The top two is always communication and leadership. Those, of course, you have to, mm -hmm. you know, deal with. But then when you get into some of these other nitty gritty that isn't applicable every time, but maybe applicable every 10th change, then it's good to consider those things. Yeah. And then you increase the probability of success. So it's not always the biggies. Mm -hmm. Back to your question about why do we keep failing? It's not always the biggies. We can have you know, leadership, but no communication, or we can have communication and not leadership support, or we could have communication and leadership, but everything else doesn't support mm -hmm. it. You know, yeah. there's all those other things. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like, I mean, if we're talking very broadly, there's probably no single root cause to this lack, to this sustainment gap. The change Agreed. sustainment gap. I mean, um, okay. I, I was going to ask, so tell us more about how what what have you learned about how people can can diagnose the situation? I was going to ask you again about John Shook. Like, do we need to do we need to start doing an A three? Do we <laughs> as he coached you through that yeah. process? Um, yeah, I mean, no. With John, what happened? Well, maybe I should back up and say John's involvement. Should I do that, or do you want me to go? Sure. Yeah. You know, go go know. ahead if you like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so. In 2014, the John is was is he's head of the Lean Global Network. At that point, he was involved also, and they saw you know lean approaches start and then fail, or start and take a pause, or you know mm -hmm. whatever. And so, but then they saw other ones just take off, and yeah. you know, so they did a global study, and they really took a lot of time, and they interviewed people at companies, and they try to find out why are these lean initiatives failing? And then why are they, why are the ones that succeed succeeding? And they came up with many, I bet your audience knows a lean transformation framework. I mean, if you're involved with LEI, they mm -hmm. may, LEI has made that a, a cornerstone of everything that they do. And yeah. it's these five categories that you have to consider when you're implementing lean. Well, what was so interesting is I was implementing not just lean, but like all kinds of change at Textron when I worked for the worked for the chairman and CEO, things like inventory reduction, which was kind of lean, yes, but also in engineering, product and process management, uh, a supply chain portal, you know, all those things where we'd be implementing change. And and I had to do like a broader look, and I mentioned the research, and then I came up with some of these, I called them considerations or things to consider every time you implement change. Well, during COVID, I was on a board with John and we had a board call. He and I were talking after on the call. And I said, what are you doing during COVID? He said, I'm writing a book. Mm. I said, oh, hey, I'm writing a book. What's your book about? <laughs> he said, change. I said, no, <laughs> mine's about change. <laughs> then we decided there's no way we could possibly be writing the change book, same, same change book. So we decided to be writing partners. And he okay. would write a chapter every month and I would write a chapter every month. And then we'd have a call. We send it to each other and we give each other feedback. Mm. And it only took us two months to realize what the Lean Global Network had done. 
in 2014 with hundreds of organizations globally and come out with the, their five areas, I had the same five. Wow. And then in terms of all independently, right? And then in terms of the 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 the, the nuances within each of the five, I had um, broken it out a little bit broader. You know, for instance, I had things like, we well, you always need to provide frequently asked questions what, to your employees if it, you're going to implement a change. Don't let managers make this stuff up. Give your managers right. and employees the answers. So and it turned out that we were writing pretty much the same mm -hmm. book. And mm -hmm. that's that's how this came to be. So his yeah. influence on me and mine on him, but his, he had a bigger influence on me because he's just so amazing, <laughs> yeah. was basically really thinking through while we blend these, what what makes sense, you know, and and but we found that independently, it's so funny, we came up yeah. with the same thing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, did, did you meet John when he was working for Toyota? Um, he was I met for Toyota in the 80s. Well, Textron was affiliated with LEI way back in ah. the in the 80s, they had put together a small group of companies. There used to be five, Coca-Cola, Medtronics, Textron, two other ones that they they called their learning community. And then, uh -huh. you know, what we did is we benchmarked each these five companies and they kind of guided us along. And and so that's kind of how and I think this is actually the 90s. I'm I'm too far back. Yeah. It's, it was it was the 90s. Yeah. And and that's how I got to know John, because eventually first I was like a black belt then a master black belt. Then I was a VP of Six Sigma. And then when I was reporting to chairman and CEO, I was running oper I was operational excellence for the whole company. And at that point, I really was looking for help. And John was John was was there and helped yeah. me and Jim Womack and um yeah Dave Lagozo mm -hmm. lots of folks back yeah. then yeah um and 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 for people who aren't familiar with Textron I mean they, they, a, a, a pretty varied set of products as a manufacturer right they were yeah. part of UTC at the time is that right no no, no. but uh Bell helicopter Cessna aircraft Easy Go Golf Cars, the largest supplier of automotive fuel tanks in the world, the largest supplier back then of fastening systems in the automotive space in the world. Um, mining industry, uh, I was in South Africa. I lived there for a while working in the mining industry in South Africa and Australia. Wow. I mean, just a really diverse company. Um and it was so if you if you Google that text on, you'll find that they were supposedly the first conglomerate in the country because uh, the guy that started Textron was in the textile, Textron, textile industry. And he needed to diversify because textiles were going down. So he just started buying up all these other businesses, Gorham, Silver, and put it all together. So it's, yeah. it's interesting company, yeah. good history. And, but the, you know, there's, there's the opportunity for people in all those different product lines, other than maybe the auto parts business of, well, we're different. We're oh. lower volume, we're higher complexity, we're uh, this or that. We're and, a job and, shop. We, yeah, yeah everybody. Happens. Everybody. And then, you know, I'd love to hear more, um, you know, with the roles or even first off, how you um, got to be at Union Pacific, where people, again, we're different. We're we're a railroad, <laughs> a, a network yeah. of railroads, right? And, and Yeah, the largest, you know, BNSF and, and Union Pacific compete to be in the largest uh, railroad in the U.S., but um, depending on how you measure it, 32,000 track miles. Um, but Union Pacific, uh, well, a recruiter called me, and I've never returned a recruiter call my entire career, and I really love my job with Textron. But, you know, he left the voice message and um, said that, you know, a job kind of like mine, but, you know, it would be a bigger company and the whole bit, and I'd get to be a part of developing it. So it just intrigued me. And, um, and I, I reached out and it turned out it was Textron, or I'm sorry, Union Pacific. And the job was to figure out what lean looked like for the railroad, because the, the chief operating officer came from GE and he was the heir apparent to be the CEO. And he wanted to use 
lean to engage employees to improve the work. And I mean, these are his words to improve. He always said, engage employees to improve the work and to uh, improve customer satisfaction. Mm. And, and so I went in for the interview and, oh my gosh, I was like, I want to, I want to work for this company is Omaha, Nebraska. And I was in Providence, Rhode Island. And I thought, Oh boy, well, would I want to go in the Midwest again? But yeah. oh my gosh. Well, and I ended up loving Omaha, but yeah. it was it was such a challenge to you've got 42,000 employees who are maybe a CBO supervisor every six weeks, never under one roof. Barely maybe you get 10 people while they're waiting for a train to pick them up and take them to the next spot under a roof. You know, I just just trying to visualize that. But um it's a great company with a great culture and uh people were thirsty for it and it yeah. and it it worked i mean it's still in place today it's been we started it in 2010 2011 um and the results were overwhelming i mean just unbelievably positive and and linked with operational results too and it seems like you know some of the same frameworks when we talk about goals or, or purpose you know same ideas that would apply you know in the auto sector or in a hospital, uh, you know, I, I always come back and think of safety, quality, delivery, cost. Exactly. Same, same goals, right? right? I mean, right. you yeah. would hope. Right, right, right. No, same goals. Um, but it's so the thing about Union Pacific, it's over 150 year old company. It was founded by uh, Abraham Lincoln to unite uh, union uh, yeah. the East and the West Pacific <laughs> yeah. when the North and South was divided. So, I mean, it wow. was a really it was a political move and um, and some and so and it started with the military model, you know, command and control. It was very much a military model. And they're very proud of who they are. And I understand that they, the, the, I mean, the, the mission is to build America. We build America. And it's interesting to go to a place that where people are so very proud of who they are and what they are, mm -hmm. and then try to say, yeah, but you're not perfect. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and there's some other ways. Um, so it was, it was, it was very interesting. And then the other thing is people go there and never leave. And back yeah. then, up until just a couple of years ago, they still had a pension plan. Mm -hmm. So the lot, you know, everybody had a lot of years of service. So to try to uh, get people to think differently when they had only worked at Union Pacific their whole lives, 40 years, sometimes you yeah. know, run across 40, 30, 40 year employees. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. So for all the things that sound familiar in terms of, of goals and the way people react to things, it sounds like there was a real situ a, a unique situation there. Uh, I bet the idea of standardized work was a change yeah. challenge because people yeah. are left to their own for better or for worse. And I've seen this in healthcare; people take pride in figuring out. They say, "Well, no one really trained me how to do everything. I figured it out." And that's right. and, and that's understandable pride, but sometimes exactly. that can get in the way. Right. Exactly. Right? I same thing. I mean, when you just do what we did in manufacturing, you get people together and you say, you guys are the best of the best. You all do it your own way. We're going to, we're going to iterate. We're going to, we're going to experiment. You can try different pieces of each other's process. Let's see what works, you know? So yeah, you get, you get through it, but it does take time and you gotta, you gotta really be patient. But when you get those successes, yeah, you know, you, they're just great, great. And but and I don't think you can assume. And there's a story about this in the book. But you cannot assume that just because it works here, mm -hmm. you can plug and play. You know, sure. I, you just you just have to treat every. You have to understand the context of every single mm -hmm. location and respect the people and let them be a part of the solution because what they help create, they support. Yeah. Right. And the time it takes to have those conversations, it takes time, right? right? right. And, I, and, I, right. and I think of a Toyotaism that I think you and I both have probably heard John Shook say a lot, this yeah. idea of go slow to go fast. Exactly. I think there's right. a lot of application to change um, situations. Um, I think of like, you know, John Cotter's change model which I think maps well to a lot of, you know, what we're talking yeah. about here. Carter like will talk it. about yeah. the illusion of progress. Like, and this is right. where like, you know, you can try to force change, 
You can try to tell people, okay, I'm sick of these meetings. We just got to standardize. Just you, get out. Just do it. You have to do it this way. <laughs> like people may give the appearance of going along, but boy, and especially with a railroad or in an operating room where people yeah. are not under the watchful eye of a supervisor constantly, right. people will say they're on board and then, yeah. you know, kind of say, well, no, well, no one's looking, so I'm going to do it my way. And, and, right, and, right. and I think uh, you, you there's no shortcuts to, no. to kind of mandate change. And, and, you know, you just reminded me, I know everybody loves thinking fast and slow. I, I, yeah. I have you know, the book. I, I mean, I bet it's like a lot of times I still don't understand it all. It's so, it's so deep and so good, but, <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of like what, one of the things they talk about in thinking fast and slow is that, you know, when your brain can't deal with something or doesn't want to, it substitutes something else in its yeah. place. And then you believe it's there. And when you were just talking, what I, what I realized that I never put this together before, but um, the whole idea of going fast, you have to stop back and say, but what do I really want out of this? Mm -hmm. You know, what do I want? I want it to sustain and I want it to be there a year from now or two years from now. And then we can't substitute that goal of, of wanting it to stay around for a goal for a implementation model that will suboptimize that, right? And that's the one thing when I went to Union Pacific, I said these words, and it's in the book. I, I said, if you want to go fast, 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 I'm not your person. If yeah. you if you know, if you want to go without engaging employees, I'm not your in person. I believe, and I this is from a Harvard business article about strategic speed and operational speed. I said, I believe in strategic speed. And mm -hmm. it means that. I want it to sustain and I want employees to embrace it. And I promise you, we will go a little slower in the beginning, yeah. but three years from now, it will still be going strong. Yeah. But if we manage to a timeline, that's a 90 in 90 days, everybody will be trained. You know, in 60 days after that, it, blah, blah, it, you know, you, you're just taking a, you're taking a chance there. And, and that, that Harvard business review article, and I can send you the link for your folks that are on the phone. It's an old one. I, discovered it through another yet another one of my mistakes uh -huh. um uh, it just basically said that they studied 340 companies globally and most of them did operational speed which they named as following a timeline implementation timeline no matter what and success was measured by implementing according to the timeline mm. versus a few companies that did what they coined strategic speed which just meant that we have our goal in mind we know what we're going to do but the timeline can be adjusted because we're going to measure regularly and make sure it's delivering the value that we mm -hmm. intend it to deliver. Mm, and right. um, and so I have latched on that then from way back. And then I've always said that we're going to make sure we're going to define the value really well and we're going to measure it. And another study that said that if it's, if it's going to fail, it's going to, you're going to see it in the first month, you can detect it. So we'll, we'll measure early. Mm. Let's, let's get this, you know, let's fix them and go on. Yeah. And, and, and adjust early. Yeah. Those years Absolutely. Fix it, fix it and go on. Yeah. And, and boy, there, there's a real art to, um, boy, like if we're, we're, we're trying something new, is it not working or not working yet? Oh yeah. How, right. how do you try to navigate so, that? Yeah, I, I agree with you. So sometimes, and I talked about, we replaced the wrong metric for the one that or we, we, you know, our mind substitutes the easy thing, the easy concept. Um, and I agree with you. There are some things that move, uh, safety metrics move slowly. If you're talking about reportables, you know, customer sat is hard to get, you know, real time metrics if you change a process, but, but what, and there's a lot of examples in the book, what we did at the railroad, but what we really did is we knew ultimately what the big metrics were that we were going to move, maybe the top line metrics or whatever. And we identified those, but we found ways always to get interim, interim measurements. And it might be just a little, like after we implement a change, we, we call the customer and we say, compare how it was before to now better, worse, the same, you know, just, just these quick hits, yeah. but you've got to, you, you know, I believe in managing 
with data. You know, you you manage with your heart in many ways when it comes to engagement, but we've got, we've got a CFO to convince that this stuff is working. And and I'm not going to have some CFO come to me two years later and say, I'm pulling the plug, it doesn't work. I'm going to have so much data that's yeah. real, that is that's robust. And so in the interim, I, I collect whatever I can. I don't put in extensive systems. I do easy, quick, but real stuff that I can trust. Um, But I never substitute number of people trained for uh, number of people trained as the cheapest substitute ever, right? We think we're successful. Oh, we trained 500 people. Are they using it? Are they using it correctly? How effective was the training? How effective was the training? How effective is the actual, you know, the results? So we put, we have to really think about, that's one of the change questions. What is the value? define it, define it. And then a little bit later, measure it. (laughs) You got to measure the value, not a, not an easy substitute. And and if we can't put the, I'm sorry, I'm on a ramp, but Uh, we can't put the energy into the, into the planning to do that, then shame on us. Cause our employees deserve better. They deserve Mm. it that we think this stuff through and we give them something that, that, that we can measure. We can work, that we, we can hear their voices We've got a, a conduit to find out what's not working. We fix it right away. Yeah. We've got to do that for people. And and then once you do, you know, it, it's like smooth sailing after just a mm-hmm. very short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, the book, again, our, our guest today, uh, D. Lynn Kelly, the book is Change Questions, written as she described, you know, the co- uh, collaboration partnership with um, John Shook. Um you know, we're, we're, we're not going to, you know, I think, clearly in a conversation like this, go through all of the questions. I encourage people no. to check out the book. There's a digital workbook that's available that's meant to be used with the book. But the digital workbook would give people a chance to kind of get a sense of, you know, what's there and and and, and get the book for the uh, the fuller story. And, and I love how the book emphasizes uh, two-way communication. Right. And I guess that's the point of a question. We're stating a question. We're actually listening to the response, not just pushing, you know, um, information. Um, but one of the questions, you know, it seems like a, a question very early on, I think, is an interesting one. You you use the word value uh, a minute yeah. ago. But this question of what's your value driven purpose? I think that's a really uh, fascinating question. I know what all the words mean, but <laughs> why why yeah. those words? Why that question? Yeah. Um, so it's very important that people and uh, understand the purpose of why they're being asked to change. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 when I was digging into this, I love this. I found a study. It was done a little while ago, but it basically said out of all the groups in the workforce now today, it was done like maybe 10 years ago. It said that the millennials have the strongest need to understand purpose for whatever we're asking them to do. And so if we think that purpose is going to go away, it, it's not, it's important to, to define purpose. And the other mm-hmm. thing that I love, which I think we can all relate to is you know, we, every phase of life is known for something. The ter- the the, the two year olds and the you know two year olds are known for being terrible twos, right? But the three year olds, the thing that three year olds are known for is, do you know what do three year olds always do a thousand times a day? Why? Yes, they ask why. I was kind of guessing. And, I don't have a three year old. Uh, okay, okay, but yeah, but right. you got it. You good right, guess. Right. You got yeah. it. So three year olds ask why. Eight on the average of eight times a day, every day. They don't take mm-hmm. weekends off because they are seeking to understand what they see and feel and sense in their environment. And that need is so basic that every everybody has that need. Yeah. So when we decide we're going to make a change, we have to define the purpose. And it doesn't take long. If it's self-evident, we, it takes 10 minutes. I mean, you just write down a, a one sentence. I say, don't don't wordsmith it. One sentence. And then, you know, we often have to get initial buy-in to change. So you've got that purpose statement and you can go to leadership. You can go to, and you just say, look, this is, this is the purpose of this change. What, what are, are you aligned? Are you in on this? And then we really can get alignment. And even with our team that's implementing the change change make sure we all understand it the same and it's a quick if 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 it takes us time then it shows how much we needed to do it yeah. for most of us we just know the answer we put it down we we mm-hmm. you know make sure people understand it but then that's front and center this is our purpose you know that we make decisions based on the purpose yeah 
And uh, you, you bring up an interesting point. You know, there, there's always these surveys that compare across generations. Yeah. And I always, I don't, I'm always a little skeptical of like, I don't know if the, whatever the, the generation is being pointed to, like, I don't know yeah. if that generation is different or if that just is the youngest generation being surveyed oh, at a given point. time where good like point. I'm Gen X and the boomers and like when, when people from different generations were young, they may have felt that same sense of purpose, but then they maybe had it drummed out of them of like, although that doesn't matter, it's just a job, right? Or whatever yeah, mindsets yeah, yeah. get, um, you know, but back to Dr. Deming, if they've been robbed of the opportunity to have pride and joy in their work, maybe they, yeah. Yeah, they, they say, I oh, have yeah, purpose, schmurpus, uh, who cares? But maybe when they were younger, it mattered. And, and, and how do we keep that going? Because I think that is powerful. We would want to sustain that need and 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 delivering on that need for purpose i think i'll get off my side right no i love that i mean i and i love the deming reference again because i think it even affected me the way i raised my kids because when he talked about if you if you rob somebody of their intrinsic motivation then it's all about extrinsic rewards and then they're no longer motivated by them, by their internal self. And so you, you know, the whole idea is, and then even in the change questions, um, what I found in some of the research, it says, so what are your incentives to have people change? Mm -hmm. And what I ended up doing, and I think it's because of Deming's influence is I, I focused on recognition, you know, Mm -hmm. which will help with intrinsic motivation rather than talking about external incentives. And I do have like, I, when I had a lot of readers of the book john and i sent it out to all of our dearest friends and they all read it and gave us they ripped it apart (laughs) and then you know one of the things i got back was well what about incentives what about in you know what about chotskis and gifts and t-shirts and coffee cups everybody loves those and i so with given all of that i i gave a throwaway line and in the book and said well if you want to do an incentive go ahead but recognition works better yeah because it's true people i do believe in that i believe Mm -hmm. that intrinsic motivation is really super important and we we have to be careful we don't rob people of that yeah yeah and it's funny maybe it just sounds better but you always hear rewards and recognition yeah it's always in that order i in my experience you can really you can flip those like with recognition and intrinsic motivation and purpose and i think especially with continuous improvement in healthcare you don't need the financial rewards um and and then there's things back to you know Deming lessons, um, quotas and 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 targets can cause more problems than they might Agreed. be solving. Agreed, a hundred percent. I really I'm big on that. I really do believe in it. Yeah. So maybe one last question as we as we wrap up, and and I'll put links in the show notes. Uh, the website is changequestions.net. Correct. That's right. I like, okay, I was double checking. You you got not, it. Not the wrong dot something. Change questions altogether.net. Um, right. You know, a, a, a book project is, you know, a, a pretty large scale change initiative you know, for the <laughs> yeah. authors and everybody involved. And, you know, when you think of, you know, back to purpose and value driven purpose, would you, did you ask yourself that question for this book? Or if I'm asking you, how would you answer that? I love that because we did yeah. and and no one's ever asked me that before. Um, so when John and I decided to join forces, which meant we had to scrap everything we wrote before, like we started all over, we had to start over and um, we said, okay, well, what is our purpose? And what we said was to get this in as many hands as possible. And so because of that, then it was not to make money. And it wasn't even to sell books. So so what we did to get this in as many hands as possible is on, you mentioned changequestions.net, the digital workbook, it's a fillable PDF. It is so sweet. You, It's free. It's free. Right. And you can share it with your friends and you can share it with your teams and you can use it because that way we fulfill our purpose of getting it in as many hands as possible. And if people want to buy the book or listen to the audio book or the Kindle version, you can do that. But you may not need it 
especially if you one person has the book and they have a whole mm-hmm. team working with them, everybody else can have a digital workbook. Um, so we really, that was the purpose of writing the book. Because for me, I felt like I learned all these lessons the hard way through all my mistakes and failures. And uh, 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 and then you think, well, when I die, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and mm. I just thought, why? I just want, and there are a lot of good change methodologies out there, really good, and I love them. But this is a little different, and it's questions instead of a, uh, you know, it's it engages the person who's doing the change in a fluid questioning ownership mindset, so that whatever questions they answer and however they answer them, the change is customized. The approach to the change is customized for that particular change. Yeah. which would be different maybe from the next change change they implement. So yeah. anyway, that was the purpose. Thanks for asking that. Well, I love thank it. you for sharing that. I'm not, I'm not surprised you had already been thinking through that. So that's uh, <laughs> great to hear. So uh, again, the book uh, is available now. Congratulations on, on that, Lynn. Um, it's available um, also in an audio book. So I see it here as Correct. paperback, Kindle, audio book. Did you and John each read? parts of the book yourselves or how did that we read our own parts Uh, i read the case study and he read he uh, did john's notes at the end of every chapter which reflected upon the chapter and then we had a voice actor read um we have a forward by the ceo of union pacific railroad and so he sounds really important and (laughs) sounds like a ceo and then we had another voice actor read the theory the regular book so yeah like four of us so hope people check that out. I have a hypothesis that people who listen to podcasts might also listen to audiobooks. And oh, uh, that makes sense. Maybe. Okay, I uh, that makes sense. I had I had somebody tell me they listened to it on double speed twice, <laughs> and I don't quite understand that. But they <laughs> <laughs> should they listen slow to understand fast instead of yeah, who knows? I didn't ask, but they said, yeah, I listened to the book twice. I said, wow, that took a long time. No, I listened to it double time <laughs> twice. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they say, I mean, look, I, I know people who listen to things, you know, 1.5 speed that the brain can yeah. really uh, understand faster than we generally uh, talk. But I'm sure people are listening and there's opportunities to pause and think through those questions. Not only how would they answer them, but how would they use those questions um, in yeah. their work. So, uh, so it's great yeah. stuff. Um, thank you for being a guest. And, you know, you mentioned mistakes and my favorite mistake podcast enough. Be careful. I, uh, I might ask you to come be a guest there too. <laughs> well, I certainly have made the mistake. So I qualify. <laughs> Big one. <laughs> and if you're willing to talk about them and I'm sure you have. Of course. Um, great reflections. So um, I will follow up with you. about. That. <laughs> okay. Um, again, uh, D Lynn Kelly, Livonia connections and yes. um, great to um, be able to read the book and and thank you um, for for being here to talk about it today really really enjoyed it thank you mark i enjoyed it too <laughs>